Um, so um, what are we doing here? Our mission is to inspire the innovator in everyone. So one of the on-ramps to getting into technology can be the arts, or it can be creating artwork. So not everybody may want to be a, a scientist at NASA, or be a coder, or be some kind of programmer locked away uh, in some room behind a screen. You know, maybe they want to create some art. So when you start creating art, you know, with technology, um, you have a whole path there ahead of you, you know, where you can learn about design, interaction, there's injection molding being used, uh, engineering, circuit boards, uh, interactive materials. I mean, how, how great is that? So someone's desire to, to create art uh, is in no way not aligned with their interest uh, in, in uh, learning about technology, science, and, and all the things that we, we are here to, to get people into at the Tech Museum. Um, so anyway, uh, let's keep moving. I'm going to just introduce uh, the, the gentleman that actually set us off on this uh, quest about a year ago uh, to integrate uh, art and technology uh, as an experience here at the Tech Museum, and that is our new president, uh, Tim Ritchie. So, Tim Ritchie, come on up. So, it's a thrill to be able to present resolution by Jamie Zigelbaum and Marcelo Coelho. Uh, and I did want to put this in just a little bit of context because I know you didn't come to hear me, but I do want to give you the context. So this was a open source competition and there were over 40 uh, entries. This was the winning one. And I want to read you what we asked people to do because I think you'll get a sense of where, in part, we want the tech to head. So this is what we said in the request for proposal. The Tech Museum in San Jose, California is hosting an open request for proposals for a long-term art and technology installation. Uh, we seek to commission a unique long-term art and technology installation to open with the 01 Biennial in September 2012. So if you don't know, you probably do 01 as this art and technology biennial that means every other year. And there are 40 or so installations around the Bay Area. The ground uh, central for all this is right here in, in San Jose. We wanted to be a good community member. We want to be uh, committed to the local community. And we also know the power of art to inspire. So this is what we said. We don't want just any kind of art. This is what our criteria was. And you'll see it tonight. The installation should have an art and technology emphasis and ideally be described as embodied, interactive, sociable, and tangible. The piece should be relevant to the Tech Museum's mission to inspire the innovator in everyone. For this particular piece, bigger is better than small, tangible is better than virtual, multi-sensory is better than single sense, motion is better than static, multi-participant is better than single participant consider how the piece can be interactive and responsive. So there, that's a mouthful there. I don't know how much of it you follow, but for something to be tangible, social, creative, inviting people to come in, using digital technology is a really tall order, and I think resolution hits the mark. So welcome, and we look forward to hearing you.
ideas and the visions and the notions um, that we experience. If we have thoughts about the world and we want to communicate them with other people through mediums, we use whatever technologies, whatever materials can best communicate that notion. Uh, just to add something to what Jamie said, going back to the, the point that Tim was making before, is that this kind of weird dissonance between artists and scientists or between art and media and technology is something that we never quite really understood. Right? We, we both met um, at MIT and students there. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. All right. I, I mumble a lot, too. So if I mumble and tell me, like, seriously, you're going to be can't understand you. So, so kind of adding to what Jamie was saying before, uh, Hello. a lot of the way that we do stuff is really kind of drawing from our background. We have this very broad background. Like I started studying film, and then French, and then design, and then design and technology, and ended up at MIT. And then in the end, you kind of end up mixing all this stuff, and you, you don't even know where the boundaries are anymore. And it doesn't really matter where they are. Uh, and, and same for you, right? You're pretty kind of broad. Yeah, I am. Um... So we met at the Media Lab. I, before that, I had studied neuroscience and uh, design, and then was studying communicative interaction and Tufts and then the weird things that we did at, at MIT. And that was because there didn't seem much reason to stay in any one domain. There's so many interesting things all over the place, which kind of informs a lot of the work that we do now. All right, good. Should I keep going? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll interrupt you. All right. <laughs> please, please do. Um, so we wanted to show you some of the materials that we use. Uh, this is just kind of found objects, um, so we'll, there's no kind of limit necessarily. We don't say we only use these things or others. There's a whole range of things. Um, and here is you know, making a model with 3D prints. Um, this is another 3D print. Injection molded plastics, sketching paper. We, we do a lot of sketching for everything that we, that we make. It's important to just quickly get it out onto um, a sheet of paper before you start building it. Yeah, with, with no particular separation too between sketching on paper or sketch on the computer, like really depending on the project, we, we start on the computer, we start on the paper, and we don't really care which one it is. They all kind of just wait to like come up with ideas and try them out. Just putting some paper shapes together to think through an idea. We also sketch in programming languages, in software, and 3D modeling, graphics. Um, we write a lot of software. We drink some beer when we write software. <laughs> <laughs> we use math. It's a nice material, also. We're not very good at it, but terrible at it. To be honest, uh, electronics we're a little bit better at. Um, and there's an incredible amount of very high-level tools now to uh, make electronics with, and we totally take advantage of the work of amazingly smart people to make things easier for us. Um, and we start in prototype, and then we make our own circuit boards and push as far as we can. Um, we use light a lot. These are some LEDs. Uh, this lighting project we're working on. Um, also structured light, like projection, um, or industrial lighting. This is a big stage light that we were hacking for something. We use a lot of strange materials too. This is a cholesteric liquid crystal. It's the kind of thing that's in your displays that you can use in different contexts. Does some funny things. Um, this is a photochromic pigment. Um, this is a laser measurement sensor. It's used for industrial automation. We use it for sensing motors. This is a mill. We do machine tools. We work with metals and woods. It's nanofabrication. Yeah, yeah, and and we not only work with all these different tools, but at different scales too, right? So the machine that Jamie showed before is this big mill where they put a big piece of aluminum into it and carve and drill holes into it. But now this is a some nanofabrication stuff that we do focus on beam and MIT actually making features that are like, like a couple of nanometers wide um, and, and both are part of the same thing. So it's really just to work across these different scales. And we, we kind of say this because it's important um, that if you're not using the materials around, uh, we find it very important to, to be able to use all these different materials and make the work that we make. We don't want to limit just to one thing. We're not just going to use paint to represent the world. We're going to try and find whatever the material is best suited to represent that idea and use that, and not be limited by whatever background that, that material comes from. Like here's a convenience store down the street from my house. The amount of stuff around us is just unbelievable. So if you want to you know, say something about our contemporary experience, we 
very important part of our practice is to use contemporary materials in order to say that. So, yeah, now we're going to tell you, show you some of our projects. Uh, so, as we mentioned before, so Matt and my team, we both kind of have gone through this long history of doing a lot of research projects and experimenting with all kinds of technologies. Uh, and some of the some of the early stuff that I've worked on was really trying to explore this boundary where materials are and how they can be integrated with technology. Um, early on, we started talking about paper computers uh, or, or e-papers or e-books. Um, I was particularly really mad at like, the e-readers because they they're not made made from paper, right? It was like electronic boxes that just have a different screen. Um, just better, better, better. Um, and. He started looking at how can I actually make paper with electronics in it, but that feels and looks like paper, and not like a computer. Um, and to do that, I started looking at how paper is actually made. Um, and I don't know if you guys have made paper before, but it's super fun. Um, so you, you get a bunch of fibers, like either from cloth or other paper. Um, you break it and you put it into this big water vat. Um, this is handmade paper too, not like industrial paper making. Um, they use a screen to scoop out the paper from this bath, um, and you you get this sort of web of water and paper, uh, and then you put over a felt sheet for the water to get sucked in and dry, and so then you can then get a sheet. And there's this really cool process called inclusion, where you can put objects in between sheets of paper, and you can kind of stack them up before they dry. And when they dry, the objects become sort of part of the sheet of paper. So instead of putting like traditional things that people do when they're doing craft, uh, I started putting electronic components, so, like conductive threads and inks and just things. So this is a paper speaker uh, using conductive ink. And what's really cool is that you can modulate the paper and change the sound, like as you would with a regular sheet of paper. Um, so these are band sensors. I'm trying to figure out if you can make a book where you can move the pages and you can sense that uh, or, or flip the pages. Uh, and this is kind of a combination of kind of sort of both worlds, where we have a sheet of paper that looks and feels like paper, but it has LEDs in it, like you know, a computer screen that does so much. And then sort of like continuing this path of material exploration, um, I've worked a lot with this material called a shape memory alloy. Um, I don't know if you know what that is, but a shape memory alloy is an alloy, uh, a mix of nickel and titanium, um, which has this really bizarre property where you can, you can memorize a shape and you can then re trigger that shape over and over again. Um, so if you, if you see on the image here, so the first image on the left, um, wrapping this little wire onto a screw to give it sort of a fixture. Um, and then the middle one, I throw the material in the oven to like heat treat it to 500 Celsius for about 15 minutes. And then on the last one, you take it out of the oven and quench it in cold water. And then after you do that, the material is going to remember that helical shape of the screw whenever you heat it again. So now I have this metal that can change shape, right, with electricity. Right? Just a thread, it gets hot a little bit and then changes shape. Um, and then I worked at this lab, Alexis Labs back then, um, integrating the stuff into textile. So we create all these different garments uh, that have, for example, this one uh, has three different flowers that open and close. Um, with a combination of the kind of material properties of the felt and of the shape memory alloy. And the other dress is has this hand line that sort of goes up and down. Let's get the sound out. It's bit, no, but, um, what's kind of interesting about this dress, they're not interactive in the sense of like you press a button and you do something, something happens. They actually program to play out this animation and the interaction with the person wearing it happens from the person not knowing what the dress is going to do. So they wear it and the dress start doing weird things and they start controlling it. And then It's funny too because the girls wearing the dress are actually some of the girls that built the dress. So they're, they're not models and they're like, they feel really uncomfortable in this video. And you can tell by their face. Like, um, so moving a little bit away from the sort of body technologies, um, when, I, when I came to the, to the media lab where we met, I was really thinking more about spaces, right? How can you bring these material technologies to our physical space? Like people putting screens and projections everywhere. 
how can we capture sort of richness of the physical world? And what I did is I created this curtain. They used the same material, um, but instead of uh, having these little flowers or a hemline that goes up and down, it has these little flaps, these little shutters that open and close in two directions for controlling lighting and ventilation. So you can imagine a curtain, right? That you, you, in the morning, you know, these little flaps open up in one direction, but it's light through at night and they close down. Um, if you're walking naked in your living room, they, they have to close really fast, or so you're able to see you naked. Or, or maybe you want to be seen naked. That's cool. Um, and um, a big part of this sort of space in creating um, experiences, I, I think, is captured by this other project. Um, this is a series of robotic balloons, um, and uh, each one of these is about, it's about like maybe two and a half meters. It's a, it's a big guy. Um, and they're programmed to sort of behave, to behave like gas molecules. So they have this kind of like they can sort of move away from each other, and they kind of get together again, and they, they bounce off again. Um, and when you walk into the gallery space, you're actually surrounded by them, right? And you can see the airflow in the room through the balloon. So if you open the door in the gallery, they, they all move in one direction. If you close it, they all sort of chill out again. Uh, this is really just a way of like trying to visualize something that's not physical uh, by creating these big inflatable structures. Okay. All right. Here's some more projects. So in kind of putting this talk together, we wanted to think through projects and show you projects that inform this piece. So this piece is about space and uh, digital technologies, display systems, the human body. And so a lot of the research and prior projects and artworks that we're showing you now kind of fill in different parts. So some of the things that Marcelo was showing um, about objects, how to make an object convey information to you. Does it do it by sh changing its own shape? Does it do it through changing light or some other property that you can sense? Um, and then also, how do you use space for, for putting information into it or for enabling communication systems between people? And these are kind of fascinating questions. Um, this project called Slurp is something I worked at at the Media Lab when I was looking at, you know, how, you know, we're using these computers all the time and these files are, are our lives. And if I want to send something to somebody else, I want to give it to them, I can't just hand it to them like I can hand a remote. I have to send it through, the, you know, across the planet. But that doesn't make any sense. Can we make tools that that make information much more like physical things in our world that we know how to manipulate. Um, so this is a eyedropper that lets you um, uh, suck up and squirt out information. <laughs> and the, all these nice things happen when you start thinking about information this way. Um, if I want to play a song, it doesn't make sense to like put it into a song player. I just squirt it onto the speakers. Wow. And even though that is Rick Astley, this does work. Uh, <laughs> that causes a little confusion on the internet. Um, so you can also, you know, have non, you know, things that don't look like they're digital uh, have some type of information shadow to them that you can then manipulate with these tools. And it kind of makes you think you know, differently about the space around you. In, in 20 years when every t-shirt in your closet has its own website, how are you going to interact with, with that space? How does that make any sense? Um, and then going from there, I uh, started working on kind of the next, the next step, which is using your body directly rather than an object to, to manipulate uh, digital information. So this is an interface called Gestalt, built on top of uh, Oblong Industries G speed spatial operating environment, which is this very, very precise gestural uh, uh, system for manipulating information. So, here we have all of these videos. Um, they're videos of projects from my research group at the Media Lab. And to interact with them rather than you know, using an abstraction like a, uh, a scroll bar uh, or, or tabs or something like that, they're just in space. And I pull them close to me to look closer and I push them away. And it's kind of People call this a natural user interface or reality-based interaction, but, but to me it's a way to expand the bandwidth of the interface between us and digital information. So if I see if I, you can start seeing um, things that are possible. So specific gestures can let you structure the space in different ways. I can make a plane or make a cube. Um, however I want to mold the digital space, I can use my body to do that and then begin to do some, some more things. I'll skip ahead a bit. Um, 
So then there's also ways to label. Oh, so you can watch a video um, with different hand gestures to play, and stop, and reverse, um, and zoom in. There's one thing that's kind of fun to add to is that being able to grab space and physically move it, it's incredibly powerful. Um, it, it's this really kind of unique experience where you don't expect to just reach your hand into the air and grab something. And move it this huge screen right in front of you and move, move with it, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it really changes the way. Like, these things, this is not what computing is. This is just happens to be the most practical form for computation that we have right now. But these things change all the time. And really, computing is about people. And how do you make people communicate and interact in more interesting ways? So if I want to look at things spread out by year, I can I can grab it a, some data off of the table and I can put it on my finger, and then that structures it on the axis. And just kind of exploring lots of different ways to look at complicated systems in very natural natural ways. And this is a, a piece that we did after that, um, where Cartier, once as we started the studio, came to us and asked us to do a very very simple interface for browsing through video. And so we made this, and uh, the idea was that we wanted it to be something that nobody had ever seen before, but they could all use right away. And so we have this, um, let's see, I guess it's not the fast forward here. And specific for this scenario, they, it, was, it was an event where they had this amazing new watch that they had just built. Uh, and there behind is like beautiful glass case or like this thing, because nobody could get near them. Um, so you couldn't really experience the watch, you couldn't really see all the work that went into manufacturing. And so a lot of the interface that we did was trying to let people discover how they were made. You know, like, like you really kind of browse through and navigate through the mechanisms of the watch. So we use this water metaphor as a way to like browse through the videos. So rather than normally you would um, you have a rate controlled or a position controlled interface, this is, you know, you want to move the video back and just push it back and it kind of flows back like water and push it forward. And, Kind of moves around. It's kind of a fun way. Um, and then this is a music video that uh, I made for the band OK Go with some friends. And um, kind of tricky to think about how it actually connects to the rest of. Uh, it doesn't. Not really. Matter. But um, we'll play it anyways. <laughs> Thank you. 
We did that a hundred times. That took us forever. We could have built one here though now. Yeah. No problem. Um, so that was a, a very, very collaborative effort with, um, led up by OKGO OK and Damien Kulash, the lead singer, was really kind of his vision. And then collaborated with Sin Labs, which is a group in LA, and about 40 people, and it took about four months to make that, and it was a hundred takes. And it took forever. How many, how many ping pong balls? Is a lot, a lot of ping pong balls. Um, but super fun, and um, doesn't really connect with the rest of uh, the work that we've done at all. But it was awesome, so we did. It. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do things because they're awesome. Um, but so now we get to the real meat of the stuff, the intellectual meat of what, what, what we make, and um, it's worth kind of saying that you know why why we make the things that we make. I mean, we were saying before that we. We do it to communicate contemporary experience, but why, why should you even do that? Um, I think it's important to push materials and experiences into spaces that you're not kind of used to so that we can understand them a little bit better. And maybe that's kind of a rough way to say what's interesting about art, but if you just do the natural thing, if you just make cell phones so people can talk more hours, then you don't really understand what that material is. But if you take that and do something really strange with it, then hopefully it helps people think about and understand what that material or process is in a new way. And that's part of the reason, does that make sense, Marcella? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're kind of at this, I mean, I, mean, I guess I'm fairly young, so I can't really say in terms of history, but I, I kind of feel like we're in this really amazing moment now where things are changing very rapidly, right? And we're having this new amazing experiences that are coming up through technology every day, and we don't really know how to make sense of this stuff. And we don't even know what it's capable of, so I think, Art has this really cool role in there, and it's really saying, okay, let's get this stuff and totally change it around and do something else with it and see what happens, and see where we're going, and try to see what the limits of it are, and what are some new interesting opportunities that are maybe not being explored by big companies making phones. You know, we're, we're surrounded by all of these things, these computers, and these televisions, and these phones, and these uh, toothbrushes. What are they? You know, what do they do? And what do they feel? Do they feel? You know, are they good? Are they bad? All these things are so hard to, to consider. But when you start playing with these things, then it kind of can change the way um, you think about them. So this piece, 640 by 480, uh, is a really important one for us. And it's kind of the, the genes behind um, resolution. And the story is we, we won this award from Design Miami, which is part of Art Basel, which is this uh, twice a year art festival, the biggest art festival in the world. And Design Miami gives out this or design of the future once a year to young designers doing new things and it comes with this great commission and opportunity to make a new piece to show in, in Basel, Switzerland during our Basel and so we made 640 by 480 um, and Marcel will jump in at any point but we made it because we really wanted to communicate something about uh, displays and about images and about um, digital images and the way that we see things today uh, and so we focused on the pixel Pixel is the is the kind of atomic unit of, of dynamic displays. It's this, it's what's in this, you know, all these little pixels. They change color, but they're kind of non-spatial. You can't touch them. They don't make sense in the body space. If they can dance, they can present anything to you. Um, but we can't form them with our hands. We don't really know what they are. Um, so we wanted to change that. And also, this is a very temporary embodiment for pixels. It just happens to be a good way to use them. But in the future, everything will kind of be a pixel. Everything will be able to move. Computation will seep into the walls around us and be part of everything. You know, digital or analog, it's just all the same. Yeah, it, it was interesting for us to start thinking through that lens, right? Because when, when you mention a computer to somebody, they normally think about a phone, or they think about their laptop, or they think about a keyboard. And it has nothing to do with computers or computation, and what it's capable of, and its communication capabilities. So we're really trying to say, okay, well, let's get the pixel, but it's what everybody understands. Sort of break it out of the box and give it a whole new kind of life and physical form and see what people can make with it. And through the form of this interface or this, this artwork or whatever it is, we by the work and this artwork. <laughs> uh, we may we, we we can communicate very specific things about, about why we are thinking about pixels in this way. Why do we put them in these boxes? Why are they this size? Why do they make just these colors? And just by using it, hopefully, the questions that we have and the ideas that we have should kind of come through. Um, so here's a, a video showing uh, about this piece. It has some party music in the background, so please enjoy it.
And here's somebody uh, in New York with the Creators Project and, um, outlining their friend's body with light. Um, it's a very different way to think about a display system and all these different people doing these things. And, and we're still pondering what yeah, it all kind of, means. It's kind of pixels like paint, right? You don't have to like get a screen. You can just get a bucket of pixels and like just paint it where you want it. And that's how you really need This is yeah, another picture. It's me looking very unshaven. Um, and so a lot of this kind of is about representation for us. And here, like, this is the world today, right? There's all these screens everywhere. Everything is kind of becoming a display. Um, but there's this long, long history of, of how displays have functioned in our culture, going back you know, 3,000 years to, to Roman mosaics. Yeah, it, it's really interesting, too. Like, a lot of this kind of... People think about technology and art. They think about pixels and LEDs, right? Which is kind of a lot of what we do. I think we're very guilty of that in some ways. Um, but there's kind of also the sense that this stuff is really unique, which is totally not unique at all, right? Like, people have been making stuff with grids and tiles forever. Uh, but and they weren't totally static either. I mean, they would change over time, and they would, uh, you know, change colors chemically or fall apart in different ways. Yeah, this is a really interesting example. This is a, it's a, it's a set of tiles. It's a mosaic. It's a Roman mosaic for this uh, kind of villa. It's right at the entrance. And it's a sign that says, you know, beware of the dog. If you come in here, you steal some one of a dog, it's going to bite you. Um, and what's particularly cool and what I really like about it is that it has a combination of different kind of tiling patterns, right? So if you look around the dog, you can see that the dog is outlined by tiles. And they also kind of have the, the sort of linear lattice arrangement up top. Um, and it really allows a sort of flexibility of you putting pixels or tiles where you want them, uh, which is, is then the kind of stuff they're trying to capture with their work. We should note that this section of the talk is about 3,000 years of history in like two minutes, so it's completely poorly constructed, but we're going to try and just reference some of it anyways. It's awesome and fascinating um, and very important to our work. Uh, so here's a jacquard loom. Um, do you know where this image is from? Yeah, I think this image is from England. Uh, it's obviously not an original photograph. I guess that was before color photographs were in. Um, but what's interesting about the jacquard, and we kind of mentioned it a little bit uh, roughly before, is that this is kind of one of the first instances of trying to really mechanize the production of the images, right? So they create these big machines, they could arrange threads into like a warp and weft. Um, and the machines would be then like feed punch cards. Can I hear it? Yeah, that's good. Is this good? Can I hear it? Okay. Uh, you, you had punch cards which then latch the, latch the computers and the virtual computers to program how these threads are arranged into the big textiles. And uh, the sort of arrangement of stuff into lattice and display grids and matrices is what then became computer screens and yeah, this, so on. This is a programmable, reprogrammable, mechanical uh, system for creating images that was you know, 300 years old. And then here's Moybridge. You know, images uh, became more sophisticated. People figured out chemical solutions like silver salts for photography. And then people like Moybridge, you know, added the time dimension so that it had images over time. So it kind of expands the possibility for how uh, dynamic representation or just representation kind of expand. Yeah. So like making images is not just a, a kind of a machine process now, but it's a machine process over time. This is a cool one. This is a cathode ray tube. Um, this one. So it was used for you know old CRT televisions for displaying. Uh, information, but also for storing information. The old CRTs and the first computers, the Arnold tube from Bell Labs and other CR, uh, cathode ray tubes were the memory unit, um, kind of the early amplifiers for allowing the first computers to work. Um, but also, in, in that example, led to display technology. So here's um, the Project Whirlwind at MIT, which became Sage, which was the first graphical interface for any computer in 1951. And it, it, it's really good to tell you a little bit about the, this image too. Um, so as I said before, both at MIT and recently uh, I've been writing my thesis. So I've been going through the MIT library and looking through these catalogs of old images of computers. And it's amazing the kind of stuff you can find. Um, and that, that image that I showed before is like an old image of a CRT tube. It was used as a memory device for this early computer that then became the display of that computer. Um, and it, it, it's this 
Are you alright? I'm a total nerd. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> We're doing a terrible Thanks. job explaining this. Thanks. Really apologize, but just kind of wanted to reference some of these things. But this this history is super super fascinating. They use these uh, kind of like oscilloscope screens um, for output for very very rudimentary computers, and then later in Sage light guns to then put input back into the system. And this is kind of like where things start getting super interesting and where this whole universe of interactive display systems has kind of emerged from all the computers that we use now. Yeah, because images now are not just like mechanized and have time, but they're also programmable. Um, and this stuff's super important. I mean, this is what we do all day, right? So we have to understand maybe some, or it's, it's interesting to think about the history of these materials, where they came from, how they became used, the way they are, how they function, and how they could function differently. So here are sub-pixels on the left from, it's like, like probably an iPhone screen or something. Um, but these little liquid crystal shutters of green, blue, red, green, um, go together to create the pixels on, uh, on your display. Um, same, very similar to an a, a LCD television or a monitor here. Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of like some of the motivations behind uh, resolution. After we made 64 before, and kept thinking about the pixel when it meant Realizing there's very rigid things about it, right? Once you have square pixels, you want to put them in a lattice. The lattice, the lattice ends up always being sort of orthogonal. Uh, but if you look at the history of displays, right, you have LCDs on the left, and then you have a CRT on the right that then has circular pixels. And circular pixels kind of bag to be put on the hexagonal grid, which is like this. Uh, and what's interesting is that now you start forming images of the stuff, and they sort of predispose like very specific kinds of images and ways to manipulate the pixels to create the image. So up top you have a neat, like you have a, a, ver a horizontal line, a vertical line and diagonals made with square pixels. And you can see that the vertical and the horizontal are really nice so you can get this really kind of precise line. Uh, but when you do the diagonal and you have these big gaps and it's hard to get to you to get a really nice continuous line. But if you look at a hexagonal display for instance, when you have the horizontal one, you, you kind of have these big gaps. Well, the diagonals are pretty perfect. They're, they're awesome. They're really good for the diagonal lines. It's a very different kind of display. Uh, and I really wanted to experiment with that. And, you, and later on, if you come up to the wall and play with the pixels, try, try that a little bit. Try arranging them in different ways, making different kinds of lines and seeing how they feel like and what they look like. Cool. Um, so um, we thought it would be really cool to talk a little bit about resolution and how we made the piece. Um, also, just uh, we're going to speak. I think the slideshow goes on for another five minutes or so, and then we're going to then we're going to show you how the piece a bit, and then after that we can talk, and you guys hopefully come and play with it a little bit. Yeah, um, and, and as I said before, feel free to jump in and ask questions if you have any. But I figured I'll just show a bunch of the image of the technologies that we use to make resolution, so you understand a little bit behind, a little bit more what's behind the light. Um, so we start by doing a lot of sketches, right? Paper, computers. In this case, we use the solid work to design the enclosure. Uh, we spent a lot of time just to get the kind of curvature of the box correctly, and, and so that it would feel good to, to hold and grip. Uh, yes, like this. And, uh, and in that process, we 3D print a lot. So we, we draw a shape, we design it, we 3D print it, we grab it, we see how it feels, it doesn't feel right with it again, and keep iterating to get it right. Um, so we have like a little 3D printer machine that can just keep pumping out different shapes and to physically experiment with them. Um, and then we start designing circuit boards, right? We figure out the shape, where the board's gonna go. Um, you use a bunch of different tools to do that. Uh, going back from like a kind of CAD tool to paper, you know, like kind of drawing stuff out and aligning components and seeing where they're gonna go. Um, so this is the circuit board that's inside of resolution. Um, on that corner up there on the left, you have the microcontroller. Um, it's based on the Arduino platform, so it's a kind of a C from where I'm running. And the Arduino. It, it, it's, worth, it's worth worth noting that each pixel is an independent computer, a yeah, full-fledged computer capable of uh, executing any kind of instructions that you give it. And so it's it becomes this very, uh, with 200 computers on the wall, the behaviors that are possible become very interesting. Yeah. Um, at the bottom part of the, the circuit, you have the kind of charging stuff. So there's, a, there's a battery inside each one of them. The bottom part of the circuit handles all the power stuff. Um, there's little things, it's two little nubs here, are the infrared receivers. So there's a remote control that you can use to paint them, uh, and that's what receives the infrared data. But right in the sort of dead center of it is an RGB LED that creates the light quality that you see. And they can change color with that LED. Um, 
this really boring? Am I boring everybody? All right. Just check. Um, <laughs> uh, this is actually um, kind of an early test of the charging maze that we designed for it. Because the thing is, we have 200 of these, they all have a battery, how do you charge it? Um, so we build this charging base, and you can sort of couple them to, to it and they recharge. Uh, so we were doing kind of stress tests here, we're connecting all of them to the charging base at the same time and see if it failed and what some of the problems were. Um, here's an example of trying to figure out how we're going to make the, the diffuser that's right in, in front of the, the tile. And it, it doesn't, when you're talking about all this technology stuff, it sounds like that would be the easiest part, but it's actually the hardest. Um, getting the lights to look right in like, different conditions and different colors, um, finding a good way to attach the diffuser to the case in a way that looks good, it's super difficult. Um, and in particular in this case, we have this layer of ITO um, uh, PT, it's, it's, it's film coated with this convective material that allows us to make the diffuser um, 